I guess we could start right now. So Jonathan Gallagher is going to speak on some joint work with Jeffrey Crutwell and Doretta Pronk on categorical semantics of a simple differential programming language. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me come and talk. I'm going to be giving you a very high level overview of how we developed a categorical semantics for a simple differential programming language described by a body and plot can. Um, differential programming is becoming like all the rage nowadays because of connections to, to deep learning um, and, and the ability to sort of have a program that I can differentiate any parameter of means that I can optimize that parameter by some gradient based method. Do you want to so, let us see your face? Oh, I'll, I'll try if, if uh, it might. You know, it's up to you. It's up to you. I'll do it. Let's okay. do it. Whatever. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, so yeah, so, um, and so yeah, we're just going to give this high level overview of, of how we came up with a categorical um, semantics for, for, a, for this programming language. Let's see. So we're going to be talking again about, you know, um, taking differential programming and putting it into a categorical framework and, you know, with respect to a programming language. And I think a lot of people here are probably familiar with sort of type theories or algebraic theories uh, and the correspondence with categories and say categories of products or Cartesian closed categories. Um, so if you wanted to get at just that aspect, some kind of type theory with some notion of differentiation, um, or maybe, you know, because we're interested in efficiency, it turns out the reverse of the derivative is, is more efficient um, in a lot of applications. We might ask, what would a category with one of these kinds of operations look like? So to do that, we're going to have uh, what's called a, a reverse basic differential structure on a category. So previously, we've talked about differential categories and, and what are called reverse differential categories. But it turns out we won't need all of those axioms. So we've dropped two of them to these to these basic things. Um, uh, and also, if you're, if you're coming from the type theory point of view, the type theories don't always describe things like partiality, so a function that's not defined everywhere. Um, and so there's a bunch of ways to, to get around that um, for functional programming languages, various kinds of monadic approaches, uh, which, which you know, have been used to sort of lift types up and you know, have the, the types embody you know, undefining this in a certain sense. Um, in differential programming, that gets a bit tricky to, to sort of use these monadic approaches directly. So we're going to use a bit of an older fashioned and more uh, direct um, interpretation where we're going to use categories of partial maps. Uh, but instead of dealing directly with an app, like a, con like a concrete category of partial maps, we're going to use what's called a restriction structure on a category. And these restriction structures are sort of like a categorical axiomatization of what it means to be a category of partial maps. And that's pretty cool. But another thing you might want to do in a program is, is use recursion. And uh, for that, um, we're going to use the fact that these restriction categories, you know, are always order enriched. And so we can do a sort of a bit of a standard move and ask for the, the enrichment to not just be in orders, but to be in uh, DCPPO so that we can interpret recursion using fixed point phenomena via DCPPOs as normal. Um, so that's how we're going to get recursion. So we won't be, we won't be using any kind of, um, we won't be having our objects be any kind of DCPO or anything like that. They're just going to be um, ordinary objects. We're going to use a DCPO enrichment to directly interpret um, recursive functions into the, into the HOM sets. Someone is asking what a DCPPO is. Great question. So a DCPPO is a directed, complete, pointed partial order. So it's, it's a partial order where every directed set has a supremum and it has a minimal element like called bottom or, or empty. And then I think that's it, right? Directed, complete, pointed. Yeah. So, so it's, it's got, it's got um, you know, soups of, of directed sets plus this pointed or this bottom element. Um, I can't really see the chat. So if, if you if you have a question, yeah, just uh, maybe unmute and say hey. Okay. Um, and also, I, I mentioned just briefly now that that uh, we dropped some of the axioms that we originally had in these reverse differential categories. We dropped two of the axioms. So a question you might you know or you might reasonably ask is what would happen if you know if I were to add 
um, or what would, what could I ex else could I do if I had these extra um, conditions in these reverse differential categories? And it turns out that in the programming language side, we can derive optimizations from the rest of these axioms, which is kind of cool that we get acts like these these axioms give optimizations. One we'll see today is an exponential um, speed up over the these the operational semantics that was originally defined, which is which is really neat to see that coming out of the the axioms. So um, some of you, some of you here might not actually be familiar with what differential programming is. I said it's sort of used in machine learning. So I thought I might give just a really quick um, introduction to, to what differential programming kind of is about. So a couple years ago, I was doing some industry like contracting uh, for an R&D like firm. And one of the things we did was we wrote a lot of ray tracing algorithms for you know, find, figuring out how particles would move through layers where each layer determines the velocity of the particle is traveling through that layer at. And it's really not super important, everything that was going on, but the, the main thing is that a lot, of these, a lot of these ray trace algorithms came down to doing a Newton iteration somewhere in it. And in Newton's iteration uh, requires you to, you know, sort of divide the value of a function by the value of the derivative of that function. Um, but in practice, you know, error propagation is a really big deal in these in these fields uh, because because you have to get these things down to really really small tolerances on the sometimes millimeter scale. And so, rather than you know using a numerical differentiation library, we actually sat down and wrote out the derivative of these functions by hand. And we had hundreds of these, and they were quite some of them were quite long and monotonous to do, and really easy to make mistakes on when you're converting them back to C++ code. Um, so so the, main, the main moral here is that if we had like a, a language where all of our programs were somehow kind of smooth things, and then, um, and then some kind of derivative baked into the language, we could just call that and maybe it would be, um, it would compute the derivative exactly. We would have to worry about you know, doing it by hand for accuracy. And it gets even worse <laughs> because this ray tracing, the, the algorithms that were being used were also not used just to figure out how the particle traveled, but to also optimize, uh, you know, the the velocity model or the the assignment of of speeds to to the layers of these things that the particles are traveling through. So, you know, to, to for these optimizations, we would also at, at some point we were using backprop for fine for, for fine tuning these um, velocity models. And so now you're taking the derivative, um, and this we did use numerical techniques for, but you're taking the derivative of a function which internally is iterating in a while loop, taking the derivative. And then, you know, maybe you would wonder about, is, is this sound, is this breaking things? Um, and so this is another place, you know, where, where differential programming would be really nice is if every program we could write would be smooth, and then we could just call this baked in derivative operation from the, at the language level, it would, it would take care of everything for us. And that's kind of the essence of differential programming is that you're, you're restricting yourself to programs that are always differentiable in some sense. Um, and then you're allowed, to, because they're always differentiable, you're allowed to use the derivative on anything for, for any reason you want. Um, well, I've got a, a lot of words here. Um, I guess why you would want to use a differential programming language, I kind of already said this. The main sort of reason is that if all of your programs are like formally smooth, then you can use the derivative anywhere at any time without worrying about um, checking that you know the function corresponding to it was smooth, and without worrying about any kinds of errors creeping in because of soundness. And you can also do a bunch of analysis based on the fact that these really are real derivatives. Things. So you can enhance the um, you know analysis you can do to these kinds of differential programs. Okay, so so the the next sort of step we're gonna like I guess say we're gonna give a pretty high level overview of what we did. Um, we're going to give a brief introduction to a body in Plotkin's language. We'll walk through quickly the structures we used. We'll show you the idea behind how to interpret that language into one of these, into one of these categories we'll define, and then we'll give a few theorems about, about the language. Okay. So again, the, the, this simple differential programming language is, is actually a very simple, it's a first order functional programming language, um, and it's, it's, it's got these, these terms, you've got sort of normal, normal terms, you've got, you know, built-in operation symbols, let expressions, 
um, if, then, else statements, while statements. But importantly, you've got this reverse derivative. So in the bottom right corner here, this RD, this lowercase RD, is a new kind of program that says I'm taking the reverse derivative of the program M uh, with respect to the variable X uh, or parameter X. And I'm doing this at the point A and with the perturbation V, right? And so this is just a formal syntactic object. You just write this thing, you say, hey, this is my derivative. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna compute the derivative of, of whatever this program is. Um, and then also you've got a derived operation. So this, these things in the purple box are often called computational graphs. They're incredibly simple programs. They have no control structures, no recursion, no if statements, no derivatives, just real simple um, products, pairings, projections, and then chaining things together with, with lead expressions. Um, and these, these are sometimes also called tape terms or traces. And these are exactly the things that you can define what's called automatic differentiation on. So automatic differentiation is denoted with this calligraphic R. It's got the same type as the syntactic derivative, but it's a derived operation. You define it on terms by induction on these um, computational graphs or traces. So that's the language. And the sort of main idea behind the operational semantics of this language that makes it kind of different-ish is that you have to have um, two mutually inductive defined reduction relations. So normally when you define operational semantics, you just evaluate your program. But here, you, we don't know how to take the derivative of a recursive program sort of you know, in itself. So what you do is you sort of start evaluating a program until you hit a derivative. And then what you do is you take this derivative and you um, symbolically evaluate it. So in symbolic evaluation, you, you take all your control structures like ifs and whiles you, you sort of evaluate them just enough to get rid of the control structures. And then what you're left with is one of these computational graphs, which you then you know, can continue um, automatically differentiating and then full, fully evaluate. So that's kind of the, the idea is that you take these programs, you evaluate them just enough to be able to, to take the derivative because on these, you know, on some kind of sub program or some simpler program. Okay, so again, that was the language, and um, we're going to just now walk through the structures we use to give a model of this language. So the first thing is that we need an operation that corresponds to that reverse derivative. So what's going on here is a reverse differential category has this assignment. So if I've got a morphism or a function from A to B, then I get a morphism from A cross B to A. So if you think, if you think about this a little bit, um, what's going on is that if I've got a, a map from A to B, then say I take its derivative, say I take the Jacobian, I'm gonna get back at a point, a linear map from A to B. And so I can take the transpose of that linear map, and then I get a map from, a linear map from B to A um, at that point. So that gives me this, this total operation is, is from A cross B to A. And you really can think of it as the transpose of the Jacobian matrix. Um, if you take this, you know, in the example of smooth functions on, on Euclidean spaces, uh, what it's really doing is it's giving you, say, if you've got a function from R into R, then, then this, this thing you get back on the right, you know, the, the thing um, R in cross R to R in, that when you get it back, you're just getting the gradient vector. So you're getting all the partial derivatives. And this is sort of why it's used in practice is that you can compute the reverse derivative in a single pass of a program's graph. So rather than computing each partial derivative individually, if you've got, say, your input space is, you know, 10 billion, um, that would take 10 billion calls. With the reverse derivative, you can do it in a single call. And that's why people like it. It gives these, you know, really fast speed ups of, of computing all the partials. Okay, um, but I thought you might, you, this community might like this, an, a different view on these reverse differential categories, maybe better. So I know that there's been some talks on these, these lens categories or these categories of state-based lenses. And these state-based lenses can be thought of as a fibration. In fact, it's the dual of the simple fibration. And if and what you've got in this category, in if you look at this diagram in the bottom left, is a map from IA to JB is a map going in the forward direction from I to J, but then sort of in the backwards direction, it goes I cross B to A. So it's kind of like this, for, one thing's going forward, the other thing's going backwards. And uh, for reverse differentiation, if we restrict to um, the category of such maps that preserve, so these categories have addition on all their objects. And if we restrict to the, the subcategory of, of these simple, or these lens categories, um, where the maps preserve addition in this B argument, 
and that's called the trivial additive bundle uh, dual fibration. And all that, a, all that one of these basic reverse differential categories is, is a section of this fibration. So there are these dynamical system doctrines that we saw earlier. Um, but so that might be a, a view that is maybe useful to some people here. Uh, the other thing we needed, as, as we said, was is restriction categories. To, so again, to give um, a high level overview of what restriction categories are. Uh, formally, they're just a category that has this bar operation. So it sends a map F from A to B to a map F bar from A to A to A. And you're supposed to think of this like the example in the upper right corner uh, as in sets, the um, F bar at X is just X if F of X is defined and it's undefined otherwise. And these are related to the other sort of main ways people talk about partiality in categories. The first one in the orange box being, um, you know, Rossellini's dominical categories. So these categories of, of sort of deterministic spans or, or partial functions. Um, and the other one being these uh, Coe-Cleisley category or these partial map classifier um, methods that are seen sometimes in a lot of times in programming. Um, and both, both of these correspond to, these, these, both of these give restriction categories and restriction categories can always be completed to be one of these things. Um, however, when we go to mix, you know, with differentiation, there's some pretty significant subtleties, especially with the purple one. So uh, for today, for today, we're just going to focus on just having restriction categories, and uh, and then it's pretty straightforward to to mix restriction structure with with uh, with differentiation structures or reverse differential structures, and all you all you really do is ask for two more axioms um, that essentially say that uh, the the do the domain of definition of the derivative is completely determined by where the function is, to, is defined. Um, and then again, the other thing we need to get to these DCPPO enrichments is, a, is a, some order theoretic stuff. So um, restriction categories always have an order enrichment and the order that you, that you use is sort of corresponds roughly to less defined than. So F is less than G if it's less defined than G. And and, and that gives us the ability to talk about other order theoretic properties. These things can have a minimal element, which is written as empty, and they can have soups. And if they have both this minimal element and all soups, then it's called a joint differential restriction category, and the enrichment actually lands in these um, directed complete pointed partial orders, because we have joins of arbitrary families of, of compatible maps. Okay, and with and and again, if you if you happen to have um, a category which has reverse differentiation plus restriction plus the compatibility axioms um, plus joins, then you can give an interpretation of that programming language, which we'll highlight briefly here. Um, I'll just say that the middle term is the important one. If I'm interpreting the reverse derivative term, I interpret it by interpreting the term and then taking its actual reverse derivative in the category. Um, and so that's kind of the idea is that this structure is just exactly what you need to interpret this programming language. Um, I won't say anything about that. And then the, the, main, the main sort of semantic theorems that we get from doing this is the first two are sometimes called source to source transformation theorems. So um, sometimes when you taking the derivative of a control structure, it's useful just to push it inside of the control structure. So I'm taking the derivative over an if then else statement, I can just distribute it into both the components. Um, and there's a similar trick with the while with while loops, which I won't say because it's a bit more complicated, but um, we'll talk about sometime. Uh, but the main theorem, that sort of the main two correctness theorems is that if I start with a computational graph and I define, and I use this um, you know, inductively defined, what's it called, automatic differentiation, the denotation of that is the same as the denotation of the formal, um, term, the formal derivative that you have as a programming language construct. And then we also have that, um, you know, symbolic, symbolic evaluation and pure evaluation in that fourth proposition, uh, both get interpreted by the same term in the, in the, in the categories. So um, we've, so we've got sort of these, these soundness theorems for the operational semantics into this denotational semantics here, which is quite nice. And I realize I'm running kind of low on time. So I'll, speed up for this one. Um, we promise an optimization. So if you just really quickly, if I've got some function which is computed using a while loop, then if I want to take its derivative, I have to expand that while loop into one of these computational graphs. 
the result of expanding this one at 1.001 is it is in the bottom middle of this slide. And what's going on is that you've just sort of, you know, you've you kind of recorded all the steps you did in, in computing the while loop. And then you take the derivative of this big computational graph at the bottom. And if you think about this, just what's going on is that the variables um, in, a, in a let expression, I'm taking the derivative of a let expression, it's sort of a function of two arguments. So it gets split into a sum and you get this exponential blow up of sums. Um, whereas you might want to, to notice that that's not necessary and that this, this blow up can be reduced um, by the observation that a lot of those things are gonna be zeros. In fact, almost all of those terms that you're gonna end up computing will end up evaluating to zero. So, and that just comes out of the axioms of these, these categories. Um, also, I, I said earlier, um, if we have the full, the full axiomatization of a full RDC, uh, then, then we can actually memoize some of the, the higher derivative stuff because there's symmetries involved. And so we can save computation and reduce the amount of work we're doing. So that's kind of cool that the sixth and seventh axiom also play a role in a, in a, in a, in a lesser degree optimization. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pretty much stop here. Uh, I just wanted to say that we've we've implemented this programming language in Haskell. I've got a little GitHub link you can you can follow. And if you wanna collaborate and maybe contribute to this language uh, or take it further, um, send me an email. I'd love to to have help. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks very much. So are there any questions, folks? You can First person gets to just ask it for <laughs> by unmuting themselves. You could also raise your hands if you know how to do that. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, Hi. Here. Do, Hi. do you think you could go back and put the, the, uh, the extra axioms that you satisfy? Um, you that there are four axioms at some stage. And I, I just, I was thinking of something else and I missed. Oh, I don't think I actually put any axioms in this in these slides. You but mean you, here? Yeah, uh, you said such that four axioms hold. Yes. What are these? So um, I don't know. Can I draw on the screen? I've never actually tried this before. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, the axioms are things like if I compose f bar. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. It's. Yeah. So it's things like if I compose f bar with f, I get f and if I'm thinking of these things as sort of domains of definition, then I'm thinking of this as meets, of composition as meets. So, um, you know, they should form, um, they should commute. Um, and then I've also got something like F bar, G bar is, I'm writing in path composition order here. So, so diagrammatic order. This is just F bar G all barred. And then the last one is the sort of important one it separates this from just being arbitrary relations. It says that if I do F restricted to someone else's domain, mm -hmm. that's the same thing as doing F H and then doing F on that new domain. And so those, those, those four things are the axioms for, for restriction. Two, three, very interesting. four. Yeah. Thank you very and, much. And, that, that's very interesting. I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, um, impressed because I think the, there is the, there's some, it looks like there's some connection with um, stuff that I've done a while back on dialectical categories. So kind of. I think so. I think these, these sort of duels of simple vibrations are, are very closely related to dialectical categories, but I'm not exactly sure exactly what the connection is. It looks similar. Thanks very yeah. much. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if my voice can be heard. Yep. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Thank you for your. Hi. Welcome. Uh, there's an old paper by Carboni called "By Categories of Partial Maps." I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I'm asking if you do know about that. Then what is the relationship to restriction category? Hmm. Yeah, I think I think those by categories of partial maps is very similar to the span construction of Rosalini. Um, 
So to get a category of partial maps, you take equivalence classes of these, of such spans. And my guess, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what they did in the, the by categories of partial maps thing. My guess is that they, they didn't take equivalence classes. They just worked with. I, I think you might be um, talking about something else. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Carboni is trying to axiomatize what you might mean by a by category of partial maps. And it's similar to the Cartesian by categories, which work for by categories of relations. But anyway. Um, is this related to the stuff like P categories and these things? that I am aware of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Somewhat idle curiosity. Uh, but, but thanks all the same. Oh, I think Chad Nestor put a, uh, a, an answer to your question in the chat. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Chad. Okay, uh, maybe we should see if the next speaker arrives.